Nick Kennedy, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Hey, John, it's good to see you and thank you for having me on. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm uh, super excited to have a nice conversation with you today about your recent book, The Good Entrepreneur, An Insider's Guide to Building a Principled Business and Powerful Personal Legacy. I love that title. Uh, you're joining us from Colorado. I'm salt, south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And uh, we're just going to have a great conversation today. As we get started, I wanted to share Nick's bio with everybody. Nick Kennedy is a serial entrepreneur and an executive coach with over 20 years of experience building successful ventures after accumulating over 2 million airline miles traveling for work while losing hours of productivity and family time. He founded Rise in 2014, a private airline. Rise created a two-sided marketplace that connected business, business executives with private plane operators to redefine travel in order to regain control of wasted time. By its acquisition by Surf Air in 2017, Rise had served thousands of travelers with private flying services. That's so cool. I've never been on a private plane, uh, but you know, maybe that's something I'll get a chance to do someday. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. And you can tell us a little bit more about that as well, if you would like. Um, but before we dive on in to talk about your book, anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context? And uh, aside from the business side, married uh, 24 years this summer to a beautiful bride, uh, three kids, and um, uh, that's my my personal life. Love the, love the outdoors, love the mountains, love the ocean, and uh, man, I just love the, I love being alongside leaders and helping them as they as they navigate what are often tumultuous decisions that they have to deal with. Uh, that's kind of where I feel like I'm called right now, and and yeah. what I get to do. Yeah, well, that's love fantastic, it. and congratulations on the wonderful family. 24 years is, is an amazing accomplishment. Uh, you have a few years on me. My wife and I are celebrating our 20th uh, here okay. in about a week. So uh, we're excited for that. And I know it's not a well, competition. I say, <laughs> well, listen, I said 24 years of marriage, 18 of them were good. So maybe you may have had more good years than I do, John. I don't know. We have, we've, we've certainly had a, we certainly had to work through a lot of things as, as humans do, right? As we sure. turn complicated. Everyone, everyone does. Everyone does, you know. Um, life is hard and anyone who says otherwise is lying or trying to sell you something. So <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> well, good. All right. So, um, actually before we dive into the book, I really would like to hear just a little bit more about rise, um, kind yeah. of where, where the idea came from, why you decided to do that. Uh, I imagine that feeds into, uh, your book as well. So then we can dive on into the book. Yeah, you know, a lot of it starts um, when I was 16 years old. My uh, my father was sentenced to 20 years in, in federal prison, and I went from this upper middle class, privileged white kid uh, kind of position in life to having to help my mom pay rent, visiting my dad in prison, and like my life got shifted really quickly. And what I didn't realize then, but what uh, having done a lot of work, I've come back to is I realized that uh, I realized that I had a chip on my shoulder. And I had a ton of shame around my neck. And I thought, man, I'm on this prisoner's kid. I'm only going to be this prisoner's kid. And so entrepreneurship was this, was this venue where I could effectively take the life I was given and change it into something more that I wanted, right? Entrepreneurship is the most efficient way. It's incredibly hard and most people aren't successful at it, but it's the most efficient way to move from the life you're given to life you're, you want. And um, I found myself as I was, as I was growing as an entrepreneur, I was traveling all the time. You mentioned 2 million miles on American airlines. I was gone all the time. That was over the course of 10 years. And a gentleman who uh, invested in one of the businesses I was involved in was a billionaire. He had a private plane. I got to fly on that private plane and my, my eyes were open because I, what I realized was the, the planes, the private planes aren't any faster. In fact, oftentimes slower than the big commercial planes, but the, the hour and a half getting to the airport ahead of time, the hour and a half afterwards, all that mess. Right. And so what I wanted was the idea, I wanted to give a gift to my customers, which was uh, uh, the ability to have breakfast with their family, go to another city for a business meeting, eat back in time for soccer practice, effectively have your cake and eat it too. And I started out by thinking about, I'm going to go buy my own plane. Well, buying your own plane, no matter how much money you have, is not the smartest idea. And so then I thought, well, I'll get 10 of my friends together, right? And we'll go do this. And then I realized, man, I've been doing market research for 10 years. And the market research was shown on the faces of all these people who were flying in first class and could care less that they were up front versus at the back. I mean, they look like skeletons of who they were. They were gaining weight. They were pale, all the bad things that happen when you travel all the time. And, and I thought, man, I think this might work. And so we put this out there and it took off like wildfire. And basically we were a subscription-based business. So people paid a flat monthly fee to fly on our planes and they got the opportunity to, uh, to go do that. 
and, and have access to a private plane. And so we used to say, hey, it was 10 times the value of flying on a, uh, uh, on a commercial aircraft, but not 10 times the cost because they shared it all. And we had a 97 NPS score and we had a very low churn and high growth and everything kind of came together. Because when you give access to somebody to a private plane, you never forget it. It becomes one of the greatest things they ever deal with. And so anyways, that was the thing that we, we, we did and Rise became uh, very successful. It was ultimately acquired by a company out in California doing something similar called Surfair. Uh, Surfair is going to go public later this year, and uh, they're still flying quite a bit. And I think it's a great model for for business executives who who don't want to have to deal with all the TSA and the lines and all that kind of stuff. And on the benefit is it's the country club of the sky because everybody who's flying is doing something cool, and you want to actually talk to them instead of put your headphones on and do nothing. Yeah, that's super cool. Super cool. Well, thank you for sharing a little bit about that. And I imagine, again, like you're a serial entrepreneur, so this isn't your only thing that you've done. You've done many things over the years. Uh, all that's great. And of course, you're an executive coach. You work with others who are trying to do similar things, you know, trying to come up with their great idea and to figure out how to implement it. So all of that's wonderful. Um, and, I, and I like that you title your book, The Good Entrepreneur. Uh, lots yeah. of people have ideas. Lots of people start businesses. Uh, but we do live in a world with a lot of challenges, uh, a lot of strife. Um, and, and I like the idea of trying to somehow meet the needs uh, of, of society and, and the social good, uh, from the work that we do. And, and yeah. it, it comes from this principle-based approach that you talk about, um, that is mutually beneficial. You know, when you take a principle-based approach to make a positive impact in the world around you, that is not only going to help your business be more successful, it's going to help you serve more people. Uh, it will help you leave a better legacy. So from a strictly selfish point of view, it's kind of the best way to go about it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, good in this title means virtuous, right? It's not so much successfully good. Uh, I say in the book, being successful as an entrepreneur is the, is the bottom line. And, and I don't want to take away from all the entrepreneurs who didn't find success or haven't found success yet, because it's really hard to do. But in my mind, that's just making money is just the basic principle of what you have to do as a business. If you're not making money, it's just a hobby. Once you're making money, what you do with that, and you think of, I think of it as five different stakeholders, right? You have your employees, you have your investors. If you do have investors, you have your community, you have your vendors, and you have your customers. And when you get all five of those stakeholders all pulling in the same direction, all wanting you to succeed, right? Your customers like your products, so they give you more money. You get more money so you can pay your vendors on time. Your vendors uh, like you, so they give you better deals. So you can pay back your investors, right? Like the community likes you because you're investing in the community and providing jobs. Like this is a, the virtuous cycle. And, and what I present in the book is this history of entrepreneurship. And I say entrepreneurship goes back to 80,000 years ago. And we have these snails uh, that were found 250 miles in from the shores of Morocco, painted with little holes in them. The snails are naturally from the ocean. But 80,000 years ago, when both Homo sapiens and Neanderthals roamed the earth together, some Homo sapiens took those snails and made jewelry out of it, and they started to trade amongst each other. So you talk about like the very basis of survival instinct, like I don't want to trust the people down the way because they don't look like me, they don't act like me, I don't know them, they might kill me, right? That was like the very basis of it. Well, somebody said, I'm going to take a risk. And entrepreneurship, the entrepreneur is a French word, and it literally means the bearer of risk. So the first entrepreneur I say is 80,000 years ago, because someone took these snails, painted them and said, hey, you have something I want. You have some meat or some fur, or you, I want to need you to teach me something. How about I trade you with these snails that I have? And then you fast forward to 6,000 BC, and you have people coming out of Africa and in Northern Africa, and you get the Nile Delta, right? And they go in there and they create the agricultural uh, uh, revolution there. And what, they, what do they do the first time in the history of, of humankind where we aren't spending 95% of our time seeking shelter or food because now we're growing it and storing it. They create the Alexandrian Library, which has 100,000 titles. Well, then fast forward to 1716, this guy named Thomas Savory comes along and he basically says, I'm going to create the steam engine. And from a thousand years before Jesus walked on the earth till 1760, Thomas Savory, the life index, how long do you live? GDP per capita, literacy, uh, infant birth, 50% of all babies died before two years old, before 1760. I mean, massive, massive change happened. That all goes up exponentially. So all these, all these times, there's these entrepreneurs taking these risks. So when I say the good entrepreneur, 
there's this idea that it's not just yours, right? I, I'm not, I'm an entrepreneur today, but I'm going to be dead someday. And my gift to give to the next generation is to teach them what I did so they can do the next gener- next thing better. And to the extent that I'm selfish with that and I withhold that and I take that to the grave with me, guess what? It's not it's not just selfish from my perspective, it's actually potentially going to hinder society, human nature. And so I think it's a big picture that we have to recognize this responsibility. It's not just about how do I become 40 under 40 40, or entrepreneur of the year or all these different things that I want to become or have enough following on social media. It's actually this idea that, man, I am standing on the shoulders of giants. And my job is to take what they gave me, make it a little bit better and give it to the next generation. And so my calling is for entrepreneurship. Yeah, make a ton of money. Go for it. There's nothing wrong with money. Just recognize that's the very first step. And after that, how you take care of your people, the culture you create, the vision you provide for them, knowing who should be on the team and not on the team and where they should be on the bus and as you're driving down the road and really getting to know people, it's so much more important than just making money. So never less than money, never less than profit, but so much more is is something I've stolen from Conscious Capitalism, which is a, a great organization around that. So that's the that's the calling of the good entrepreneur. And and I write about this in my book about man. So many times, I wasn't a good entrepreneur. Like I just I cut people off that that that, that didn't give me what I thought I deserved. Right as the CEO, or I you know I wasn't listening. I, I wanted a chorus of yes men and women around me. And and quite frankly, in my marriage, wasn't in a great situation. And and so all. All these things happen, this pressure happens on you as the CEO, and you there's no training for the CEO except to be a CEO, right? There's no like finishing school. You just have to go do it. And I thought I had 80% of what I needed to be a CEO. A buddy of mine, we just went on a motorcycle ride this last uh, last weekend, and he's a first-time CEO, and he said, he said the same thing I thought, which was, man, I thought I had 80% of what I needed. It turns out I had 20% of what I needed to be a CEO. And you just don't know that until you're in the hot seat. That's the goal of the good entrepreneur. Yeah. It's a challenge for people to, to think about long term around this legacy. What's the legacy you're really behind? Yeah, yeah, I love it. And again, maybe it sounds counterintuitive. And, you know, so many leaders, so many executives, so many entrepreneurs are so hyper focused on profit that, uh, you know, they, they feel like that's the, the most important thing. It is foundational. You can't exist yeah. without making money, of course. Um, it's oxygen, it, right? You need it to live. <laughs> yeah, you need it. You need it. Otherwise, you will not exist anymore. You will not function anymore as an organization. But to be able to get past that, uh, there's so much research that shows uh, how, you know, taking a stakeholder approach uh, can really benefit your organization, how building those sustainable relationships, how those how that will enhance your ability to bring value to the marketplace. Uh, so, yeah. so many of the things you just mentioned, right? That when we learn how to do that better, it takes energy, it takes time, uh, but it's worth the investment. It's going to produce much greater outcomes than if we're just simply figuring out, trying to figure out how am I going to um, sell more of XYZ widgets, you know, in the next month. Um, again, you need, you need enough to, to pay your people. You need enough to stay afloat. But if you're always only just focused on the short-term outcomes, you're going to rob long-term impacts, yeah. right? And, and all the negative yeah. externalities and exploitation and all those things that can happen, regardless of your good intentions, that they just happen when humans get together and, and ego gets in the way sometimes, uh, just short-sightedness gets in the way, uh, immediacy and, and urgency get in the way, like all that. And unless we can take time you know, to really recognize our values, our principles, and then get committed to living them. Uh, and that means sometimes you might have short-term um, failings that yeah. will build the foundation for long-term success or, or slower short-term growth that will help you build in a more sustainable way for a long-term um, sustainable future. You know, it, it, that takes discipline. That takes faith, yeah. frankly, yeah. right? That your effort is going to pay off. Well, that's why it's so, so important to, to know what your why is, right? Because if you have a why, then you can you can you can put off the short term success for long term success. I write about in the book a, a friend of mine who was a guy who had the private jet. His name is Patrick Soon Chong, and he's a multi billionaire in, in L.A., second richest guy in L.A. behind Elon Musk. And or I guess Elon's not in L.A. anymore, so maybe he's the number one. I don't know. But um, twenty years ago, he's doing transplants between pigs and humans, trying to cure diabetes finds a disease that could kill a human, 
ends up getting and stops the research, ends up getting sued by his investors. Fast forward 20 years to 2008, and he owns a, a generic pharmaceutical company called APP Pharmaceuticals. And heparin, which is a blood thinner used in every surgery in America, every surgery everywhere, including all the dialysis around it, it's a blood thinner, uh, becomes tainted in the United States. And there's like three providers of it. He's one of them. I forget who the other two are, but the other two cannot prove that their heparin is clean, if you will. He can because he owns a million pigs because the very basis of heparin starts in pig intestines, right? So you think about this decision he made from 20 years prior. So now he becomes a sole provider of heparin in 2008, right before the financial crisis. His company gets bought for several billion dollars, of which he's the majority shareholder of it, becomes a billionaire. Talk about waiting for 20 some years because he made the right decision, knowing I can't do research on, can't do this research because it could harm humans. Really is in a world of hurt for two decades and then comes back right before the financial crisis and gets dumped a ton of cash in his lap. That's an extreme version of what we're talking about here, which is when you make these right decisions in the long term, they pay off. And quite frankly, I see too many guys and, and, and unfortunately they're mostly guys who are out there with these these like in your face youtube channels and the tiktoks and like the whole like like let me tell you how to get rich fast and like there's just no there's there's no way to go do that properly and to the extent you do get rich fast you're gonna get poor much quicker than you got rich fast right because you don't know what to do with all that money and and i just think it's this gift i think it's the second it's a, i call it entrepreneurship the third invention of mankind between fire and stone stone tools and just like the body needs red blood cells to survive, the purpose of the body is not to create red blood cells. A business needs money to survive, needs profit to survive, but the purpose of the business is not to create money. The purpose of the business is to understand what the why is and take care of all those stakeholders. And when you do that, and conscious capitalism has a ton of information, you actually are financially more, benefit, more uh, uh, successful than otherwise. And that's what's so cool about this. And so I, I just tell the story of like, man, I went from this kid whose dad was a prisoner to, you know, I spent hundreds of hours in a prison visiting room and hundreds of hours in a private jet. And I can tell you the decision, the, the number of decisions between those two that depend determine where you are is less than five decisions, right? Like not many decisions between you're in a private jet, you're in a prison. And we wanna believe those two, are, which are the farthest apart on the face of this earth, are so many decisions and they really are, the reality is are they're just a couple of intentional decisions to decide what to go do. And that's my calling that I feel is really important because at the end of the day, when you integrate the personal and the professional, then you can be fully integrated and healthy and you can connect the longest journey in the world, which is the 18 inches between the, the mind and the heart. And when you can do that, you can recognize that, that the reason you're making bad decisions as an executive is probably not because you're a bad executive. It's probably because somebody's triggering you that happened when some, to something that happened to you before you're 18 years old. And when you can tie those things two together and you can become really clear and you can do the work around that, guess what? You're unstoppable. You're unstoppable and you move from survival, which is that I'm in the cave, hope hearing, a, uh, hearing something in the middle of the night. So I'm going to like sh shut the door and not go out and like, like fight, fight or freeze to like, no, I'm actually going to go integrate myself, this negative reality about myself. And I'm going to become a better decision maker, a better listener, a better leader across the board, a better husband, a better wife, a better child, like across the board, you become a better human. And that brings you peace. And then the money just takes care of itself after that. And that's the journey we're all on that. Yeah. I want people to, to really be enjoy that, that process. Yeah. And, and of course not, not everyone's going to have that next billion dollar deal or the unicorn startup or whatever, right? That entrepreneurship is hard. <laughs> Coming up with a really great idea, implementing it, bringing it to market, adding value to the market consistently in a sustainable way, that is really hard. So, we're, you know, I don't want to give the, off the impression that there's like some easy fix to this and it's just have purpose. That's clearly not the case. But yeah. But when you build on all the skills that it takes to be a successful entrepreneur and you ground it in the principles at, that you've been describing and that we have this clarity around what we're trying to accomplish with our organization beyond just making money, that's when we, we can drive more long-term sustainable success, which by the way, will lift others around us at the same time, right? So we're not building ourselves on the backs of others and exploiting other people to get ahead, but we're actually yeah. lifting everyone around us. And that 
brings more meaning, fulfillment, and all of that. The other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, clearly starting a new enterprise, that's entrepreneurship. Um, but you can have an entrepreneurial mindset and spirit about you in any organization. So you can work for yeah. a large corporation and be an entrepreneur, starting new initiatives, new product lines. I mean, we, we all can and should try to foster that kind of a mentality and an approach. Um, and again, recognizing that we're not, you know, we're not in it to, to, to just inflate our egos. It's not about trying to step on as many people as we can to get ahead, but yeah. like, let's leverage the capacities of those around us to do some really cool things and to yeah. solve some really challenging social problems. Like, let's do that yeah. And, yeah. and accomplish some really cool things. Uh, John, I, I'm so glad you brought that up. That's the, that's the message I want to leave the audience, which is if you're a bearer of risk, you're an entrepreneur. And, and teachers are entrepreneurs and middle, mid-level managers are entrepreneurs and HR directors are entrepreneurs. Like you, if you choose to take a risk and you put yourself out there, knowing that you might fail, right? I mean, the definition of risk-taking is you might fail, but you still go ahead and do that. Man, if you're in an organization that fosters that, if you're, if you're a CEO, you want every one of your employees to think of themselves as entrepreneurs. Why? Because the reality is you don't have what it takes to do it by yourself as a CEO. You need people to come alongside you and go, hey, have you thought about this? That's what we all need to, need to foster. And that's where, all, that's where all good things, now I happen to be a Christian and I believe all good things come from God, but take away God for a second. All good things besides God come from an entrepreneur. Someone took a risk. I'm right, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking coffee from Columbia this morning in a Yeti mug from some, that somebody created out of Austin, right? I'm talking to you on an iPad that somebody created. All these things we did came from an, uh, that we're using right now came because someone took a risk and said, you know what? I would rather look at someone's face instead of, uh, uh, and not have to be in person. Boy, I sure want to keep my coffee warm, uh, a lot warm. And by the way, I don't want that Folgers crap. I want some good stuff, right? Like those, someone took a risk and said, I wonder if this will work. Entrepreneurs are everywhere. If you take a risk, you're an entrepreneur. And when you do that, good things happen, even if you fail, because now you're going to become a better person because you're going to be, come back later better. And golly, you might actually succeed. And when you do that, you actually change just a little bit humanity going forward. And that's all that we've ever done as humans to get to where we are today in 2022 as homo sapiens. I mean, it's crazy to think about the yeah. role we get to play in this. We always I used to think like, it's just somebody else do that. No, it's like you get to go do this today. Coming on this podcast and getting to chat about this. Like, hopefully we get to encourage someone to go, I got this idea I've been thinking about for a year. I'm actually going to go pull the trigger on it today. That's, yeah. what, that's like what entrepreneurship's about. Yeah. And, and it's as easy, if not easier today than it's ever been, you know, the barrier to entry in so many areas, um, in the, in the technologies that can assist us to enter the market and provide value. Um, it's, it's tremendous. And so, yeah, if yeah. you have great ideas, whether it's independent of your job or whether it's par as part of the company that you're a part of, yeah, go explore that. Try to, try to, um, to suss it out and, and give it a go and, and take a little bit of risk and not everything works and that's okay. Cause you learn, you learn, you grow yeah. and you develop. So all of that I think is fantastic. Well, Nick, it has been a real pleasure. I know at the time I'm going to have to let you go here in just a minute, but before we wrap up, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Yeah. So the easiest way to connect with me is just go to Nick Kennedy and I C K K E N N E D Y dot guide. Um, that'll get you to all the things that I'm doing that are out there right now. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching, I do group coaching, and I do online digital courses as well. So kind of like the same information, regardless of what your budget is, uh, these principles are what we're focused on. Here's what I would love to leave you with. Um, you may not think you're an entrepreneur, but trust me when I tell you, if you're willing to take a risk, most of the time, good things happen. Think about it. Don't just take a crazy risk. But when you think about it and do the methodical processing of it. If you problem you have, if you have a problem, most likely thousands and thousands of other people have a problem. Most great entrepreneurs start with the problem they had. I didn't want to get on American Airlines one more time. That was my problem. And it turns out thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have that same problem. Take a risk, do it the right way. Think about long-term, make a ton of money, go for it. Have a huge house in the mountains, have a big boat in the Cayman Islands, but also recognize you're just passing it on to the next generation. That's what I would love to leave with your listeners today, John. Thank you for the opportunity to be on your, on your amazing podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Nick can do for you. Check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. They can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. 
and I hope you all have a great week.